Welcome back Commodore fans. Today I'll be using the LADS assembler to create an interrupt routine that will clear text from the screen, starting at the current cursor position when the user presses the F1 key. Here's a quick preview. I'll load the directory, then move the cursor up to the middle of the screen, then press the F1 key, and presto, all the text after the cursor disappears. The 128 has this neat little function built in. You press the escape key, then the at symbol to delete the text. We're going to add this nifty little function to our 64. First let's take a look at the LADS assembler itself. LADS appeared in the 1984 book, The Second Book of Machine Language, by Richard Mansfield. This book was the successor to Machine Language for Beginners, which I actually bought and used to learn 6502 assembly. Unfortunately, I never knew that a second book existed, or never discovered it at a bookstore, which is a real shame because LADS is a pretty comprehensive assembler. LADS will run on the Commodore 64, VIC-20, PET-CBM, Atari, and Apple computers. Of course, we are going to focus on the Commodore 64 version. LADS is an MLX type-in program, a very lengthy type-in program. And in a pleasant surprise, the VIC-20 version can be created by typing in a short patch to the 64 version of the program. That's a nice two-for-one deal. Let's start by creating a traditional Hello World program. We don't have to load or run LADS until we're ready to assemble, so we'll set it aside for now. Instead, we create and edit the program in the basic editor, using line numbers the same as you would for a basic program. Let's start by clearing the screen, and I'm going to switch to lowercase because that's what I'm used to seeing when programming. Like every assembly program, we begin with the address of where we want the machine language program to be stored. The syntax is the same as most assembly language editors, which will be a star, an equal sign, a space, and a numerical address. Let's use 49152 which is the typical starting location for machine language programs on the 64. You can use hex or decimal numbers in your program with one exception, which I'll show later. One other final note here. There must be a space between the equal sign and the number here. From now on, if there is a space between characters, go ahead and assume that it's required. The next line will be a pseudo op command to direct LADS on how the program will be assembled. The two main options here are .o, which means LADS will assemble the program directly to memory, and .d, followed by a file name, which LADS will use to create a binary object file on disk. You can use either or both at the same time. However, each command must appear on a line by itself. Here is the list of all the LADS commands. Note that source files can be chained together if you so desire, but today we will do just single file assemblies. Okay, now we just enter our code normally using the standard assembly syntax, which I'll type in and fast forward through. While I'm doing that, I'd like to point out that you can enter multiple instructions per line, separating them with the colon just as you can in BASIC. I'm only putting one instruction per line to keep everything neat and tidy for the video. Okay, now that we're done, let's take a look. At line 40, we load the A register with the low byte of the string address. Line 50 loads the Y register with the high byte. And in line 60, we jump to the string out routine to print the null terminated string. We won't need an RTS command here to return to BASIC. The string out routine ends with an RTS and will return to BASIC since there are no more instructions to execute. Line 80 is our label appropriately named string. Labels have to be at the start of a line. It cannot be on a line by itself. Also, labels must be followed by a space, followed by instructions or data. The dot byte command can be used to define both strings, as we see in line 80, and individual data bytes, as defined in line 90. When defining numerical bytes, they must be decimal numbers, and are separated by a space. Using spaces to separate numbers is difficult because you are so accustomed to using commas, both in BASIC and many other applications. And finally, in line 100, 
we end the program with the dot end command, followed by a space and the name of the source file, which will be the name we give it to save. Now that we've created the program, we save it as a normal basic program. We save it with the same name indicated with the dot end command, which is hello. Now we are ready to assemble. LADS only assembles by reading the source file from disk. So once our source file is saved, type new and load the LADS assembler. Don't forget the comma one to indicate that it's a machine language program. When it's finished loading, type new again. Then we clear the screen and type the name of the source file in the top right corner. Then move the cursor down a few lines and type sys 11000. You will see something similar to the following based on the options you choose. No errors were reported, so our program should now be in memory. We start it with sys 49152. Success! There is our message. Now let's do a directory listing and make sure the object file was created. And it was. Let's give that a quick test also. First I'll reset the computer to clear everything out. Then load hello.obj. Start it with sys49152. Success again. Okay, now that we've got the basics of the LADS assemblers down, let's move on to the interrupt driven text clearing utility. Just type new, clear the screen, and we begin by setting the starting location to address 49152 again. And I'll assign a variable called screen to the zero page hex address of FB, which will also include FC. This will be a 16-bit number used to reference the screen location in our program. I'll start with the same assembly options as before, .o to assemble to memory, and .d to create a binary object file. Okay, I need to pause it here for a minute. This is future Ken. I later discovered that the LADS assembler did not process my choice of output file name as displayed here. My chosen file name contains the basic keyword CLR and is stored as a token and not text when saved. LAD still created a working object file, but it was somehow changed to the name scrtxt.ml. I will circle back to this at the end of the video, but for now I thought it would cause less confusion to point it out and change the output file name to cltxt.ml which does not contain a basic keyword. Okay, let's continue on with the program code. I'm also going to add the .s command to display the code listing to the screen while assembling, and at the same time send it to the printer with the .p command. The .s command is required if you send the list to the printer. We start out by defining a new interrupt vector. First, all interrupts are disabled with the SEI instruction. We then proceed to load the low and high byte address of our new routine and store that address in hex locations 314 and 315 respectively. That new address is defined with the label clear. Then we enable interrupts again with the CLI instruction. When the user runs this program and the new interrupt is set, I want to print a text message on screen informing the user that it's now enabled. So let's do that now with the same function we used in the Hello World program. Normally, I put text and data at the end of the source code, but today I'm putting it here to keep a visual continuity with this block of code. When this block of code is executed, it will put the address that points to our machine language routine into the kernel standard interrupt routine. So every 1 60th of a second, our routine will get executed. Okay, now for the new routine. We start with the label clear, as referenced above. And since it can't be on a line by itself, we begin the code by loading the accumulator with the keyboard's matrix coordinate value of the last key pressed. This value is located at hex address C5, that's 197 decimal. We then compare that to the value for the F1 key, which is four. How do you know that matrix value? You could look it up in a table, or you can easily determine the matrix value of a key by running this short basic program. We want to print 
the peak value of 197 and then go to 10 and run. The default value is 64, which means no key is pressed. Now I'm pressing the F1 key, which is 4. Here's the F3 key. Now F5. And well, you get the idea. Just note the value of the key you wish to use. And back to our code. If the F1 key was not pressed, we jump to the exit. The exit will just be a jump back into the standard IRQ entry point at hex address EA31. If the F1 key was pressed, then we get the address of the current line the cursor is on. This is located at hex locations D1 and D2. We get the low and high byte and store them in our previously defined screen variable. This location will be used as the starting point to clear text. Let's take a look at what we're going to do. Here is the default screen map for the 64. It starts at address 1024 and ends at address 2023. The cursor is currently on line 10, which starts at address 1424. It doesn't matter where on the line the cursor is. It could be in column 0 or column 39. You will still get the address for the start of the line, which is 1424. Since we now know what line the cursor is on, all we need to do is create a loop that starts at 1424 and ends at 2023 and put spaces into the corresponding screen locations. Similarly, you could also clear text above the cursor. Just start the loop at 1024 and end at the current position. So let's get back to our machine language and create the loop. We start by loading the Y register with zero. Y will be used as the offset and will always be zero. Next is a label for the start of the loop, cleverly named as loop. Then load the accumulator with the code for a space, which is hex 20, 32 in decimal, and then store it at the current address contained in the screen variable. Next, we increment the screen location by doing a standard low byte, high byte addition with carry. Then we test to see if we have reached the ending screen location plus one, which will be 2024 decimal. That's 07E8 hex. It's plus one because we are testing after incrementing the screen location. The high byte is still in the accumulator and is tested first. If not equal to 07, continue the loop. If it is equal, we load and test the low byte. If it's not equal to hex E8, we continue the loop again. This continues until the address reaches hex 07E8. When the loop ends, we do a quick cleanup before exiting. First, I'll move the cursor to column 0 by storing a 0 at hex location D3. D3 contains the current column position for the cursor. Then I want to clear the last key press by setting the matrix coordinate value at address C5 to the default value of 64, which means no key pressed. And finally, we exit the routine by jumping to address EA31, which is the entry point to the standard IRQ interrupt handler. And the last line is the dot end command, followed by the file name, which I'm going to call clear text, spelled C-L-R-T-X-T. Okay, that's it for the code. Let's get this saved to disk. All right, with that done, type new and then load the lads assembler. When loaded, type new again, clear the screen, and put the name of the source file in the upper left corner. That's upper left. Some of you may have heard earlier in the video that I said to put it in the upper right corner. That was wrong. So after typing the name in the upper left corner, Cursor down a few lines and type sys11000 to start the assembler. Since we enabled the .s function to list the code on screen, we can see the code displayed as it's being assembled. The screen list is kind of messy and hard to read, as it is formatted for 80 columns. 
Here's what the list looks like on paper. Notice that the list did not include the starting location or the compiler commands. You do have the addresses on the left, so you still know where the program starts. Now check out the LDA instruction that is using a label. It moves the less than or greater than symbols to the end of the label instead of after the number symbol. Also, it didn't print semicolons before any of the comments. However, putting all that aside, the printout is still very readable. Let's get back to the program. I didn't see any errors during the assembly process, so let's activate it by typing sys49152. And there's the enabled message. Let's test it by moving the cursor up the screen a bit, and then press F1, and BAM! The text after the cursor magically disappears. Let's check the directory listing and make sure the object file was created. And yes, it was, so we're all good here. One quick note, if you're doing this at home, be aware that some utilities like Super Snapshot use the function keys as keyboard shortcuts and could interfere with this clear text utility we created today. So keep that in mind when using it. Okay, a few minor bugs to report. First, as I previously mentioned, when using the .d command, pick a file name that does not contain a basic keyword. LADS will still create a functional object file, but it won't have the name you intended. This bug does not extend to the label names. You can use basic keywords as part of a label, or as a label by itself. For example, I'll change the output file to poke.txt.ml and change the label name loop to print. This program still assembled correctly and works, but the output file name is now called scrtxt.ml. Another minor bug is that sometimes when using the .s command to list the code to the screen during assembly, I would get blank lines in a listing after clearing the text. I couldn't figure out what caused this. At first I thought my program was possibly writing spaces beyond the screen RAM or something. So after clearing the text, I checked screen memory in the VICE monitor, and no, that is not the problem. As you can see, the screen memory contains all spaces, and stopped at the intended address. I suspect maybe the screenless command didn't properly close out or clean up when completed. But again, it's not a fatal error, as everything still works. And finally, on a positive note, LADS is a fairly decent, easy-to-use assembler with common features you would find in a more comprehensive package. It takes advantage of the built-in full-screen editor, and maybe most importantly, at least for me, you can use labels, which makes programming and assembly so much easier. I wish I had found LADS back in the day. As it was, I struggled along using Supermon 64 or some other monitor where you have to calculate and recalculate the branches and jumps when editing your code. Okay, that's all. I'm done for now. I'll see you next time, and as always, be careful out there.